I feel like I'm going to explode today with this message. I don't know why, but I'm just expecting God to, to do some, some cool stuff. Uh, excuse me. All right. So we're going to continue the story we finished. We started last week, which was Zach and Lizzie, okay, and little Johnny, the forerunner to Jesus, the Messiah. Before I do that, I want to tell you, um, so there was a quote, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you the quote, I'm just going to tell you the essence of the quote. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian during World War II, and, he, and, he, and he's talking about Advent. And I remember a few years ago reading through a book of sermon, his Christmas sermons. And I remember at the time reading through them and going, I've got nothing here to work with. I mean, seriously, right? I did that. Um, and so um, he write, somebody else was, I was reading an article, somebody else said, he said, Advent is like a man sitting in a prison cell waiting, knowing that his only hope for deliverance from that cell is from somebody coming from the outside and unlocking the door. In other words, the hope that you and I want we have no, we bring nothing to the table to gain it. We have nothing to offer that would unlock the door. Our sin separates us from God. And the hope of Christ comes in the hope of his coming. Come thou long expected Jesus. The song we just heard, right? It's about we're waiting for your return. And as we preach through the series called As We Wait, they were waiting for the Messiah and I hope you and I are too. Not for the first coming, but the second coming. Advent means arrival. And with his arrival comes the glory of God. That's why there's light all over the Christmas story. The angels, they, they, they proclaim and praise, and there's just this flood of light that blinds almost the shepherds and leads to more light. And it's the light of Jesus. He said, I am the light that that, you know, I am the light of the world. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, you are the light of the world. In other words, you're going to pick up the baton and carry it and you're going to shine for me. And that's, that's how this is going to end here today, this, this passage in the rest of chapter one of Luke. As I was sitting there singing though, God reminded me, I had not thought of this until just that last song we sang. When, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's talking about being in a cell he was in prison in Christmas, in a Nazi German prison. So he knows what he's talking about when he's talking about hope. And of course, they eventually executed him. When we read about the Apostle Paul in the Bible, we're reading about a man when he talks about joy. This man was a man who was behind bars because of that joy. He understands. We don't understand a lot of that because we haven't been there. It's harder for us to truly understand. But I do think God can bridge the gap for us, and I, I need him to do that for us today. Because when you ever, whenever you preach or talk about mercy, it's really hard to grasp it for us. Because most of us have never experienced a deep mercy that we can kind of cling to emotionally. It kind of goes over our head. We like intellectually can grasp it, but it's really hard for many of us to, because most of us have not experienced a huge situation. We've been over our head in justice and we deserve justice and we get mercy instead. Most of us don't know that. And so when God talks about mercy, we have to tell stories and try to get there and try to feel it. And, and so, but I, I need you to get beyond even the emotion. I need you to understand and comprehend the mercy of God. And, that, and this is why. Because it changes lives. It transforms lives. We're going to look at this and there's going to be five people or groups of people whose lives are changed ultimately by the mercy of God. And we are direct recipients of that. I um, remember, I guess it was 10 or 15 years ago, I went and saw the first Transformers movie. I was blown away. Now, I didn't grow up watching the cartoons. I couldn't care less, any less than, than you know, it's Transformer, whatever. But everybody was talking about it. The trailer looked great. And I love a good sci-fi yarn. And so a group of us uh, guys went from the church to watch this movie. 
because most of the guys that I went with, they all grew up on Transformers. And so I'm like, whatever, let's go. And I was truly blown away. It was... So if you think about the best animated feature you've seen, you know, and there's just some pretty amazing animated movies out there. It's basically an animated movie that is so realistic that you believe those Transformers really exist. And what's a Transformer? For those of you that don't know, it's an alien. They're aliens. They come to Earth, and they are basically living machines that can transform into an ordinary machine. So they come looking like robots, and then they can transform into trucks and tanks and jets and helicopters and drink machines and coffee pots and cell phones. They can just transform into whatever. And, and if you think, and, and you can't, you can look at the transformed object, and you would never know that was a living robot, okay? Why do I tell you that? Because the word transformed is, is so loaded that as awesome as that was in that movie, as awesome as that visual CGI animation was to me in the moment, the transformation that Jesus Christ brings to the soul is infinitely greater. And it's because of the great mercy of God. Okay, so um, a simple, if you, maybe to go from sci-fi, tech, let's go nature. This year I planted flowers in, my fr in front of our house, lots of flowers. I mean, it's 2020, I got to do something crazy, right? And so I planted lots of flowers out front and I didn't expect the butterflies that we had show up. Oh my goodness, I saw all kinds of butterflies. I don't know. I didn't think I could plant anything that would grow, much less bloom. And it was just beautiful. And, and for like six months, butterflies. But as a kid growing up, what I really loved, I didn't care about butterflies, but I did love caterpillars. And I loved to find those nests where you stick the stick up in the nest and they all fall out. And we would try to collect them in buckets and basically kill all those future butterflies. Because a caterpillar, a worm, metamorphosis is in through, goes through a metamorphosis, a transformation, and it goes from the ugly duckling to the great swan, basically, to use a story analogy. It's transformed into something beautiful. Again, it's just a, a hint of what God wants to do in the human heart through Jesus Christ. So when I say the bottom line for today's message, I want you to hear all of it, but I don't want you to miss the point is transformation. I'm doing this because my sentence ends right here. <laughs> God's great mercy leads to radiate the leads to radiating joy and praise that transforms lives. God's great mercy leads to the radiating of God's joy and praise that transforms lives. It's not just joy and praise, that in and of itself is good enough, but it leads to something that brings God even more glory, and that is the changed life, the humble heart, the surrendered life. And we're going to see that in Zach and Lizzie and Johnny and the crowds in this story. So with that, let's get to the good stuff. Scriptures, verse 57 is where we're going to start in chapter 1 of Luke, and we're just going to get as much of this in as I, I can get in, I'm not going to get it all in, but we're just going to, we're going to go until we, until we run out of time. And that will be good. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her, say it with me, great mercy. And they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Now, let's, re let's recap last week so we can get the context. Zach is a priest, one of 18,000 priests in Israel. It's his turn to go to the temple. He gets to go two weeks a year. Out of all that get to do that, only a handful get chosen to go into the Holy of Holies and offer incense. He gets chosen by Lot, which is basically rolling dice, and God's sovereignly using that to choose him because he has to be the one. He picks him. He goes in. He's doing his thing, and all of a sudden, boom, there's an angel there to the right of the altar. 
and it's Gabriel. And Gabriel says, I've got some good news for you, Zach. You're gonna ha- your prayers have been answered. You're going to have a son, and you're going to name him John. And all Zach can come back with is, now, how are you going to do that? We're so old. Now, I don't think it probably came out quite like that, except for this. He doubted, and the angel calls him out on it. He's like, I come from the throne of heaven and tell you this good news that you prayed for, and now you're not going to believe me? You will not speak for the next, until the day he's born, till the day this happens, till the day this prophecy is fulfilled, you will not speak. And he was deaf and mute for the next nine months. Talk about challenging situation. And so through that, he gets through that, they get through that. Elizabeth has a baby. We're going to find out how that all plays out. But that's kind of how it's set up. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has this name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. Or That's praising God. That's what he started. First words out of his mouth. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And then there's the song, which I will come back to, verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly in Israel. Okay, so let's think back to our, our bottom line. God's great mercy leads us to radiate joy and praise that leads to transform lives, okay? So what I'm looking for in the story is the things that God's great mercy is going to bear fruit to. And I'm looking for joy and praise and other things. And, and so I want to walk through these with you. Now, um, ju- first we see in Elizabeth, we see that this happens at least three ways. First of all, from the earlier reading last week, you'll remember um, that she she was that she's as she's carrying little Johnny, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if she's carrying him filled with the Holy Spirit, she's carrying the Holy Spirit. Okay, before God did that very much with very many people, I don't even know of um, a situation other than Mary where that's happened. For, for, a, for a woman, okay? Mostly, most of the time, it's guys. And um, so, she, so we see it there. We see it in her carrying it. We see it in the process of the pregnancy. Think about it. She's carrying this one who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who's going to have a significant role coming up. He's going to be, quote, great in the sight of the Lord, the angel said. So she's thinking, this, is, this, this kid, wow. And then we see that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. Okay? Now, why is this significant? It's going to be significant for the same reason it's going to be significant in the life of Zechariah. God is preparing them to prepare the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. You see, he is working. He is working. And I could go back further. I could go back to... Elizabeth's parents. I could go back to Zach's parents. I could go back to their grandparents. I could go back, right? I could keep going back. And you and I are in a family tree. And our lives will impact the following generations just as our lives have been impacted by those generations before us. Sometimes for good and sometimes not. I can't change how I've been impacted. I can change how I respond to that. And I can change how I'm going to live going forward, but I can't change the past. But what I can do is this. I can have eyes to see the mercy that God gave me, even if it's just 1% of what I got. I can still see the mercy. Because if you can hear the voice of God, then you have received his mercy, and you have reason for joy and praise that leads to changed lives. Okay? Now look at Zach. He also was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that in verse 67. It's, I don't know if it comes 
right as he says John. I'm pretty sure he writes on the tablet, his name will be John. I'm guessing that at that point, the Holy Spirit fills him and he prophesies and prays. And we're gonna unpack that in just a second, but he's impacted by the Holy Spirit. He's impacted by um, just parenting and being, well, no, in the, in the two wildernesses. The first wilderness is the wilderness of silence and solitude, which, by the way, is one of the most neglected means to grace that Christians have access to. If you look at the, if you read the old church fathers, if you read saints from the past, silence and solitude are gems that shape our character and make us more like Jesus. And in America, all we know is constant noise. Just ask yourself, when was the last time I drove to work or drove anywhere without the radio on, without anything on, without anybody in the car? And then there's Johnny, little Johnny, Johnny the B. Not Johnny be good, but he be better, okay? So um, John is blessed and transformed by the mercy of God through those parents, right? Perfect parents? Nope. I mean, we've already seen he doubted an angel who's standing right there. Hello. But we also know their character. Back to verse 6 in chapter 1. Both of them, Zach and Lizzie, were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So we know their character is incredible, and yet he doubted. And you know what? That should be a little warning sign for those of us who have been Christians for longer than 10 years. And maybe you're walking with the Lord really, really well. You and I are still vulnerable to that. Okay? Let's not get too high and mighty. In fact, I think young people in particular, young Christians and young people who are Christians have a huge advantage because when something dramatic or amazing happens, they just seem to have an easier time with amazing, boom, big, dramatic God. I mean, transformed, right? It means vivid and dramatic and life-changing just kind of by definition. We old, crusty Christians, sorry, can be crusty, crusty-hearted sometimes, Because we're so wise and reasonable in our faith, right? Because we have a reasonable faith. We have a faith built on reason. It's not a blind faith. It's not a a, a, your mind's so open, your brain rolls out kind of faith. It's a genuinely built on ration and reason, but it's still faith. At the end of the day, I cannot see, therefore I believe, or I don't believe, okay? All right, And, and, and this is especially important if you've grown up and been a part of the church for a long time, and maybe you're very churched, but you're not, you don't know Jesus. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you, you probably know, if you're in that camp, he's probably tapping you on the shoulder right now, and that's mercy tapping on your shoulder, okay? It made me think of the Phillips, Craig, and Dean song when mercy came running. I love that. Just mercy is God in, in the flesh at Christmas, but it's God making a way for salvation for you and me. It's God coming to that prison cell that we can't get out of and unlocking the door. Not because we deserve it and we were unjustly imprisoned, but because despite the fact that we were justly imprisoned, he makes a way for us to get out. And that is somebody else paid the penalty so that you could walk. That's the cross. That's the story of the cross. Um, And then, so Zach also has the other wilderness. Look at verse, uh, I'm sorry, John. John John has that third wilderness. Look at verse 80. And the child, that's John John the Baptist, the child grew and became strong in the spirit. Okay, what does it take? Okay, that's a whole sermon right there. What kind of parent do you have to be to raise a child? You have to be a parent... If, if you don't do any of the other things, you have to be willing to let your child live in the wilderness. Okay? I just shot down a lot of helicopter moms. Not, on, not me, but, right? You know what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not even going to preach that sermon today. All right? But it's strong in the spirit, and he lived in the wilderness. You want to know how wilderness? He didn't have an Eno. He didn't have a Coleman stove and a nice out in the under the stars or maybe in a cave and 
he didn't have these great, you can go to the camping stores and buy these prepackaged meals. That's what I do when I go camping. I buy the prepackaged stuff or, no, no. He ate locusts and wild honey. Now, wild honey, honey, that sounds good to me, but I don't know how much honey it takes to drown out locusts. I don't know if this is locust, the buzzing bug, full of protein, I'm sure, or the flower. I, it doesn't matter to me. Neither one tastes good, I'm imagining. I don't care how much honey. And he grew up in the wilderness. God shapes us in the wilderness. Because it is in the wilderness we find ourselves needy because we don't have everything stripped away. And so then what happens? What are we left with? Me and God, I guess I better go to God because I can't go anywhere else for anything. Folks, if this is, this is, he's in the wilderness for years. I picture him leaving home as an adult, a young adult, maybe as early as 13 when he has his bar mitzvah, and, and he doesn't come out until it's time for his public ministry. Well, he's just six months younger than Jesus, his cousin, so he's, in, he's 30-ish. So this is someone very comfortable with bad hair and nasty clothes and eating bugs and, right? He's very, and yet, Jesus was only in the wilderness for 40 days. Now, he didn't eat for 40 days. Okay, that's another, right? But the wilderness, that's where God takes us. And some of us, we, we uh, when, when bad things come our way, when dry seasons come our way, when struggles come our way, we just want out. And God's saying, just stay in the wilderness with me, will you? Will you just, just hang with me for a little bit? I'm trying to teach you something that I can't teach you in the abundant world that you are accustomed to. Let me strip it away. And sometimes he doesn't give you a choice, and sometimes he does. So just, just open up to that, okay? Part of the message of Advent, and, and uh, Bonhoeffer said this too. He said, part of it is the waiting. Is that while you're waiting, that you're open, Okay, so if I'm in a prison, if, if I'm picturing, Bonhoeffer's basically saying this, so he's sitting in that cell on a Christmas Eve, his fiance writing letters to his fiance who he'll never marry, or did they marry? I can't remember, but they didn't, they didn't do life together. Waiting with hope, peace, joy, love. I think those are the four Advent candles, are they not? I think that's right. Maybe there's the connection that I've been missing all these years. I don't know. See, I'm still learning. Imagine, though. But he's waiting with expectation and open-heartedness. Are you? They were waiting for the first coming, the first advent. We're waiting for the second. Now, you, this may be news to you, but he's coming again. And he's not doing the baby thing again. God doesn't do anything the same way twice in a row unless there's a reason and repetition. Usually it's when he's trying to explain something to a guy. He's like, I go, I gotta do it again. So you get it a second time. But, but most of the time, God's so creative that he's like, I've gotta do this a new way. Burning bush, been there, done that. Now, we're gonna do a warrior. Uh, we're, gonna do, you know, we're gonna do a fig tree. We're gonna wither that tree and make that. He just keeps doing things differently because he's infinitely creative. But are you waiting? Are you even expecting his return? Are you prepared for his return? Because if, you know, a lot of people want people to, like me to preach through the book of Revelation, which I have yet to do, and I, it's on my, it's not on my bucket list, but it's on my list to do, okay? I need to preach through Revelation. But I can tell you the punchline, are you ready, is the application of applications for the book of Revelation, right? Because if he's coming back, and it could be any day, and you believe that, then I would hope you're living as if that was true. Because, yeah, he could wait another thousand years to come, and it could be this afternoon. I might not finish this message. Are you that ready? I mean, at least he finds you in church. I mean, you know, gold star, right? Whatever, you know. So there's, there's the three for John. Now there's two other groups of people. There's, you know I had to stop at this word. You know, all over oh, 65 all the neighbors, right? All the neighbors were filled with awe. What does awe mean? Fear. Why would they be scared? He just had, they just had a baby. 
because he was silent for nine months and deaf for nine months, and he does exactly what he was supposed to do. He writes, his name will be John, and boom, boom. He can speak and hear, and they're like, whoa. And, and they get the, the, that tingling sensation that runs up and down your arms and goosebumps and all of that, and they're like, something, and wow. And they say, along with a lot of other people, everyone who heard this one wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. It was obvious to them that God was moving, that God was present, and it was blowing them away. So the neighbors, right, think about our neighbors. Did they even know that Jesus is coming back? We put, a, we put our manger scene out um, yesterday in our front yard. It's the, only, it's the only Christmas decoration I put out. And actually, I had help. Thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not good at the other stuff. So I make sure that we get that out there, even though I put it up together. I put it together yesterday all backwards. But anyway, I got it up there. Finally, we got it with some help. I got it all situated. Because if I, my neighbors don't know anything else about us, I tried to put it out for Halloween, but I kind of got, you know, maybe you don't want to do that. <laughs> Be a good neighbor, right? I didn't want to scare anybody. All right, so all the neighbors were filled with awe. And then he goes to the, a bigger group. Now, their known world was not as big as ours. Columbus hadn't sailed Ocean Blue in 1492 yet, okay, because it's not even 92 yet. But it says, all the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Word spread, okay? Now let's go back to our bottom line, right? God's great mercy causes us to radiate joy and praise that transforms lives. It transformed Zach and Liz and little Johnny, the neighbors and the rest of the world. We're here 2,000 years later. We're talking about, we're spending time and energy and money to make sure that we lift up this great and good, merciful God. We're going to celebrate publicly on Hutchinson Square on Christmas Eve. We're going to do it so that you don't even have to cross through, you don't even have to come through our doors. We're going to make it as easy as you can. Just drive and pull in and join us. And you know what? Most people are going to know at least that Christmas is about something spiritual, whether they know what it is or not. Now, I have a few minutes left, and I want to teach you about Zachariah's song. Now, I don't know if Zachariah was a singer or not, okay? I just don't know. Excuse me. But he is now, and I don't even know if it sounded good, honestly, but he's singing praise. That's when you know someone loves the Lord, when they're willing to praise and sing praise to God even when they can't sing, right? Because there's no pride in that, okay? Or, when you, or, or maybe you're someone who doesn't like to sing. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be praising the Lord. It doesn't mean that that's not an offering to him. Oh, I could go on. I'm stopping. All right, go. verse 68. Now, this, is, this song is a song of prophecy, and it's in two parts. The first part is Zechariah speaking to the Lord. And the second part is Zach speaking to his son, John. Okay, it's very personal. And then it ends with a, he kind of, then Jesus kind of shows up. Now, he's not by name, but he shows up at the very end. Now, um, what's so cool about this is if you read the, um, if you read the, pro, the, the tenses and everything in this, you'll see that when he describes and he's talking to the Lord, he's talking about something as if it happened in the past, but he's talking about something that hasn't happened yet as if it's happened. He's talking about the future. He's talking about the future salvation that's going to come because of Jesus, but he's talking about it past tense as if it's done because it's as good as done. It's going to happen. You can bank on it as if it had already happened. That's how sure this prophecy is. And of course, we're on this side of it, so we can look back and go, yeah, and it doesn't impress us at all because it just goes right over our head. Let me read it to you. The first thing he starts is with praise. He starts off telling us who God is and why we're praising him. Watch this. Starts in verse 68. Praise be 
to the Lord, the God of Israel. I was thinking that this, I was also thinking this during the song. Never thought, never had this thought before either. It was talking about king of Israel, born as the king of Israel. Israel is a nation right now, right? 1948, you remember that? That's an amazing miracle because they weren't a nation. They were defeated and then they became a nation again. When does that happen? Okay, but that's another, that's a, a gene history nugget he'll have to um, unpack one day. Israel doesn't have a king or do they? Right? It's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, right? He's the top Yahoo over there, right? Am I right? Is that right? He's not a Yahoo. That's Yiddish. I was just, no, just kidding. So, because, you know, I don't know why that is true, but this is my guess. I'm going to give them a lot of credit right now. I think they know they have a king already and they don't need to have one down there on the throne. Now, they didn't get that right in the Old Testament. That's the book of Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, that whole story. And it's not a great story in a lot of parts because they thought they needed a king like everybody else. Maybe they've learned. I think maybe. Praise be the Lord the God of Israel, that's who he is, but he's not just the God of Israel because he has come to his people and redeemed them. What does it mean to redeem? It means to buy back. It's like paying a ransom to free somebody. Doesn't he say that in Mark 10? I did not come to be served, Jesus said. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Okay, so he's paying it. Now, what's the, you know how you watch the TV shows and somebody's got somebody kidnapped and they're like, I want, you know, $30 million in a helicopter, you know, and, and so, you know, they're always trying to work out the deal. What's the payoff for this? It's like, I want your son's life. I want the king dead. That's Satan. That's what he wants. That's the price to be paid to free all the people. And Jesus pays the price. Now, I, honestly, Satan probably didn't ask for that. I don't, know, I don't know what's running through his warped mind. But that was the solution that the father sent his son to carry out. Satan's not that creative. So he tells us who he is, and he tells us why he did it and why he's praising him. This whole passage is about salvation, and it, and it focuses on salvation for Israel. But it says that because Israel, remember, is to be a blessing. They are being blessed with salvation to be a blessing to the nations, to take salvation to the nations. That's why Israel has been chosen, not because they're good, not because they're really amazing people, but because God said, I pick you, Abraham. And so he does it through this nation. And this is why you can read the Old Testament and go, why did he pick them? Because it wasn't because of how they are. It's his God way of saying, let me show you what I can do with them. Right? It's kind of like I think, you know, I look in the mirror and he goes, let me show you, Darren, what I can do with you. You know? Well, that's, you know, you can take that to an unhealthy place. But that's a good thought to realize I'm nobody. He's everybody. And apart from him, I can do nothing. But with him, okay? So that's John 15. He has raised up a horn of salvation. Horn represents power, like kingly power. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So this is pointing to Jesus, saying there's a Messiah coming. He's, he's coming from the line of David, which was prophesied, okay? This third of your Bible... That's all promises made, and this third of, these two-thirds of your Bibles, promises made, this third of your Bible, promises kept. That's the New Testament, okay? And, and so what we're seeing here is, is he's talking about those promises. He's saying, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Well, Jesus hasn't, but has he? He's, he's, he's right behind, he's alive, in the house of his servant David, from the line of David. So Mary, from the line of David, look at the book, book of Luke to see her genealogy, Joseph, Jesus' adopted father, line of David. Go to Matthew to see his. From the line of David, from the tribe of, da uh, of Judah, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, this is, again, Old Testament prophecy, verse 71, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, verse 72, to show 
mercy. There it is again. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. Think marriage relationship when you think covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham ties it back to the blessings in Genesis 12. Okay, 2,000 years before this happened. To rescue us, there's salvation again, to rescue us, Israel, and then everybody else by, by extension, from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, which is why we're still here. To, we get to serve him in this great, holy search and rescue mission, making disciples who make disciples, motivated by the love of God that started with him loving us. That's the praise for God's salvation. And then he turns and he says, now let me tell you, let me tell you, let me talk to my son, John. And you, John, my child, will be called a prophet of the most high. Jesus called him the greatest of all the prophets. Think about that. You can throw every hero in the Bible, Old Testament, into the category of prophets, just about, if not all of them, better. Okay? John the baptizer. You will be called a prophet of the Most High. Prophet of, that's another way of saying a prophet of God. For, here's why, you will, here's his purpose, you will go on before the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus, to prepare the way for him. And how is he going to do that? He says it in the very next sentence. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. He's going to teach them how to be saved. John the Baptist. Remember his message? One word sermons. Repent. Repent. Which implies that you believe there's a God you've offended and need to repent to because of the sins that you've committed because you've transgressed his holy law. And again, so it requires faith. So it's repentance and faith. Repent and believe. Mark 1.15. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus said, that's what he's talking about. That's what John's purpose was. It was to basically, if you remember my illustration from last week, remember I said, um, if you've ever tried to point something out to your dog and you notice the dog never looks at where you're pointing, the dog always looks at your finger and misses the point. And it's like John the baptizer is the big giant index finger pointing to Jesus and at first, that's what everybody was looking was at John's finger. Well, that was by design because John was trying to, basic, to use agricultural terms, to use the parable of the soil's terms. He's trying to use the, John and the law and the Holy Spirit to break, to plow up the heart, their heart, the soil of their heart, which in some cases is very packed and rocky and needs to be broken up so that the seed of the gospel can land and take root in good soil that's been broken up and loosened so that it's receptive. And, and when we, that's why you preach law. That's why you preach 10 commandments to help people see you can't, you can't get in heaven on your own. Try keeping the 10 commandments for one day. Try doing that for one day. And you might be going, well, I can not murder somebody for a day. I, you know, I can not commit adultery for one day. I can, I can go a whole day and not tell a lie. I just won't talk. Okay? But you've got to remember the spirit of the law is that it doesn't just have to happen physically. It can happen here. Okay? And that, okay? So when you and I realize that I, I cannot stand up under the law, I don't want to be judged by that standard because there's no way I get through that. I need mercy. Okay? I need mercy. I need to not get what I do deserve. Okay? I need the judge who just condemned me guilty for speeding to take off his robe and come around and pay my fine out of mercy. I'm not going to give you what you deserve, even though you deserve it. And then he says this, and now he's going to swing to Jesus. Because of the tender mercy of God, there it is again, mercy, mercy, mercy. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. What rising sun do you think he's referring to? The light of the world, maybe? To shine on those living in darkness in their prison cells and to guide our feet into the path of peace. 
And of course, peace is more than just the absence of hostilities. It's more than being able to walk into your house and somebody's not yelling at somebody else for a minute. This is that, that, uh, that peace that surpasses all understanding. It, it just, it, it covers you, it's, it sweeps through you, and no matter what it is you're going through, it's there for you. Now, some of you are going through, you would describe it pretty horribly. Some of you are going through some horrible things emotionally, mentally, financially, physically, spiritually. And you can have peace in the midst of that too. This is the kind of peace I'm talking about. I'm not talking about covering it up, sweeping it under the rug, hoping nobody knows. I'm not talking about putting a mask on here. I'm talking about in the midst of your incredible pain and suffering, whether it's for you or for someone you love, you still have that peace. You can have that peace. That is the mercy of God. That's what it is. It brings peace. Love, joy, peace, hope. Are you expecting those things in this coming of Jesus? Are you waiting? Are you open? Are you recognizing the fact that you have a role to play? Even though God is the one who's going to do the heavy lifting, you and I can still stiff arm God, or I can bend the elbow and give him a shot. Right? It's kind of like you're, there's a bully, and, and the bully's threatening you, and, and you're, you're, you're trying to just not get smoked. And you realize, no. I'm not going to walk in fear anymore. I'm going to stand up to the bully and I'm going to surrender my cheek and I'm going to take whatever comes because God's mercy is enough. Wow. Do you see it? Do you see it? We sing about it. We pray about it. We talk about it. Let's not forget about it, okay? Let's pray. Lord, there are people watching, there are people in this room that, that need to believe that you really are a God of mercy. They need to believe that. And God, I just have enough faith to believe, maybe barely enough, that you want to give them all the faith they need to believe it if they will just surrender their pride, humble themselves, and give their lives to you and receive that mercy. But God, that is not going to happen. You're not going to push through the stiff arm. They've got to open up and let you in. I can't make that happen. I don't want to make it happen. If I can make it happen, then somebody else can change their mind. God, if you prepare their heart right now and their mind right now to be open enough to receive your mercy, then God, I say, have at it. Invade and flood their hearts with your mercy right now. May the tears flow. Forgiveness. May they receive that forgiveness and realize there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You've fulfilled every requirement the law asks of us. And if we trust in Jesus' fulfilling of that law, we don't have to fulfill the law. We get to live the law of Christ as a fruit of that, but we can't earn it. May we believe that and live that. Lord, not just for those who've never trusted Christ, but for every single one of us who has trusted Christ, because it's a daily believing in the mercy of God. We need you today in Jesus' name. Amen.